the bull tom yorkfield had always regarded his half-brother lawrence with a lazy instinct of dislike toned down as years went on to a tolerant feeling of indifference there was nothing very tangible to dislike him for he was just a blood relation with whom tom had no single taste or interest in common and with whom at the same time he had had no occasion for quarrel lawrence had left the farm early in life and had lived for a few years on a small sum of money left him by his mother he had taken up painting as a profession and was reported to be doing fairly well at it well enough at any rate to keep body and soul together he specialized in painting animals and he was successful in finding a certain number of people to buy his pictures tom felt a comforting sense of assured superiority in contrasting his position with that of his half-brother lawrence was an artist chap just that and nothing more though you might make it sound more important by calling him an animal painter tom was a farmer not in a very big way it was true but the helsery farm had been in the family for some generations and it had a good reputation for the stock raised on it tom had done his best with the little capital at his command to maintain and improve the standard of his small herd of cattle and in clover ferry he had bred a bull which was something rather better than any of his immediate neighbors could show it would not have made a sensation in the judging ring at an important cattle show but it was as vigorous shapely and healthy a young animal as any small practical farmer could wish to possess at the king's head on market days clover ferry was very highly spoken of and yorkfield used to declare that he would not part with him for a hundred pounds a hundred pounds is a lot of money in the small farming line and probably anything over eighty would have tempted him it was with some especial pleasure that tom took advantage of one of lawrence's rare visits to the farm to lead him down to the enclosure where clover ferry kept solitary state the grass widower of a grazing harem tom felt some of his old dislike for his half-brother reviving the artist was becoming more languid in his manner more unsuitably turned out in attire and he seemed inclined to impart a slightly patronizing tone to his conversation he took no heed of a flourishing potato crop but waxed enthusiastic over a clump of yellow flowering weed that stood in a corner by a gateway which was rather galling to the owner of a really very well weeded farm again when he might have been duly complimentary about a group of fat black-faced lambs that simply cried aloud for admiration he became eloquent over the foliage tints of an oak copse on the hill opposite but now he was being taken to inspect the crowning pride and glory of helsery however grudging he might be in his praises however backward and niggardly with his congratulations he would have to see and acknowledge the many excellences of that redoubtable animal some weeks ago while on a business journey to totten tom had been invited by his half-brother to visit a studio in that town where lawrence was exhibiting one of his pictures a large canvas representing a bull standing knee-deep in some marshy ground it had been good of its kind no doubt and lawrence had seemed inordinately pleased with it the best thing i've done yet he said over and over again and tom had generously agreed that it was fairly lifelike now the man of pigments was going to be shown a real picture a living model of strength and comeliness a thing to feast the eyes on a picture that exhibited new pose and action with every shifting minute instead of standing glued into one unvarying attitude between the four walls of a frame tom unfastened a stout wooden door and led the way into a straw-bedded yard is he quiet asked the artist as the young bull with a curly red coat came inquiringly towards them he's playful at times said tom leaving his half-brother to wonder whether the bull's ideas of play were of the catch-as-catch-can order lawrence made one or two perfunctory comments on the animal's appearance and asked a question or so as to his age and such like details then he coolly turned the talk into another channel do you remember the picture i showed you at totten he asked yes grunted tom a white-faced bull standing in some slush don't admire those herefords much myself bulky looking brutes don't seem to have much life in them dare say they're easier to paint that way now this young beggar is on the move all the time 
aren't you fairy i've sold that picture said lawrence with considerable complacency in his voice have you said tom glad to hear it i'm sure hope you're pleased with what you got for it i got three hundred pounds for it said lawrence tom turned towards him with a slowly rising flush of anger in his face three hundred pounds under the most favourable market conditions that he could imagine his prized clover fairy would hardly fetch a hundred yet here was a piece of varnished canvas painted by his half-brother selling for three times that sum it was a cruel insult that went home with all the more force because it emphasised the triumph of the patronising self-satisfied lawrence the young farmer had meant to put his relative just a little out of conceit with himself by displaying the jewel of his possessions and now the tables were turned and his valued beast was made to look cheap and insignificant beside the price paid for a mere picture it was so monstrously unjust the painting would never be anything more than a dexterous piece of counterfeit life while clover fairy was the real thing a monarch in his little world a personality in the countryside after he was dead even he would still be something of a personality his descendants would graze in those valley meadows and hillside pastures they would fill stall and byre and milking shed their good red coats would speckle the landscape and crowd the market-place men would know to promising heifer or a well-proportioned steer and say ah that one comes of good old clover fairy stock all that time the picture would be hanging lifeless and unchanging beneath its dust and varnish a chattel that ceased to mean anything if you chose to turn it with its back to the wall these thoughts chased themselves angrily through tom yorkfield's mind but he could not put them into words when he gave tongue to his feelings he put matters bluntly and harshly some soft-witted fool may like to throw away three hundred pounds on a bit of paintwork can't say as i envy them their taste i'd rather have the real thing than a picture of it he nodded towards the young bull that was alternately staring at them with nose held high and lowering its horns with a half playful half impatient shake of the head lawrence laughed a laugh of irritating indulgent amusement i don't think the purchaser of my bit of paintwork as you call it need worry about having thrown his money away as i get to be better known and recognized my pictures will go up in value that particular one will probably fetch four hundred in a sale room five or six years hence pictures aren't a bad investment if you know enough to pick out the work of the right men now you can't say your precious bull is going to get more valuable the longer you keep him he'll have his little day and then if you go on keeping him he'll come down at last to a few shillings worth of hooves and hide just at a time perhaps when my bull is being bought for a big sum for some important picture gallery it was too much the united force of truth and slander and insult put over heavy a strain on tom yorkfield's powers of restraint in his right hand he held a useful oak cudgel with his left he made a grab at the loose collar of lawrence's canary-coloured silk shirt lawrence was not a fighting man the fear of physical violence threw him off his balance as completely as overmastering indignation had thrown tom off his and thus it came to pass that clover fairy was regaled with the unprecedented sight of a human being scudding and squawking across the enclosure like the hen that would persist in trying to establish a nesting place in the manger in another crowded happy moment the bull was trying to jerk lawrence over his left shoulder to prod him in the ribs while still in the air and to kneel on him when he reached the ground it was only the vigorous intervention of tom that induced him to relinquish the last item of his program tom devotedly and ungrudgingly nursed his half-brother to a complete recovery from his injuries which consisted of nothing more serious than a dislocated shoulder a broken rib or two and a little nervous prostration after all there was no further occasion for rancor in the young farmer's mind lawrence's bull might sell for three hundred or for six hundred and be admired by thousands in some big picture gallery but it would never toss a man over one shoulder and catch him a jab in the ribs before he had fallen on the other side that was clover fairy's noteworthy achievement which could never be taken away from him lawrence continues to be popular as an animal artist but his subjects are always kittens or fawns 
or lambkins never bowls end of the bowl by saki